and um, and welcome Matthew McGill. So uh, Matthew, um, so fantastic that you're able to to join us. And um, so Matthew is going to be presenting about the OCS autonomous uh, ocean exploration vessels. So uh, over to you, Matthew. I'll just unmute you. Um, or try to unmute you. I think, is it working now? Ah, uh, that's better. That's great. Okay, it's time. Give another minute for everybody to get in. We've still got a few people arriving. So uh, we were originally hoping that Matthew could have the boats out on the water during his talk, but with the with the various lockdowns happening, that uh, that turned out not to work. I like the uh, the video background. That is, yeah, I'm jealous of that. I have to have a separate session to teach us how you did that, Matthew. Oh, basically, where you select the image, you can select the video. Right. Oh well. Try that later. I could put a storms video up there. Ocean storms video. You know, we're talking about the engineers here. I think uh, in the next hour, we, we just got the nerd sniped. An hour from now, there's gonna be like crazy backgrounds on everyone's video in a few minutes. I'm pretty sure a lot of us got that out of the system on uh, Thursday when we were uh, testing it all, didn't we? I don't know. I reckon I've still got some more geeking to do. Okay. Probably time to start now. Great. Okay. Sorry. Welcome everyone. I'm Matt McGill and I'm here to talk about OCS, the development of the OCS glue bottle. Where am I going? Oh, um, Matthew, where, where are you based out of? We're based out of Sydney, currently on the UNSW uh, campus at Randwick. So not far from the racetrack. Um, just a couple of links to the web page, and later on, if you want to check it out, we've got a YouTube channel to check out the videos of the boats in action. So the company that was founded in 1997, sorry, in 1997, Solar Sailor competed and won the Advanced Technology Boat Race in Canberra using a newly developed solar sail, beating the next competitor by about 30 kilometers. This inspired the company's founder, Robert Dane, to found the company and build upon this success. In the next few years, the company built a number of solar sailor prototypes, culminating in the built the, the design and construction of six high-tech hybrid electric, uh, sorry, solar diesel, sorry, hybrid electric ferries in Sydney, China, and Hong Kong. Four of them are still running, uh, ferrying people to and from the Hong Kong jo Jockey Club. Um, in 2007, uh, an inquiry was made as to whether or not we could provide a platform that can go to sea forever. And the company began research into unmanned solar, wind and wave powered vessels. In 2014, the company changed its name to Oceus, that it has now, and to reflect the expansion of the company's technologies and the change in the company's direction. We constructed a number of model, uh, scale model, uh, scale models, 
which would put through testing in tanks and in the in water tanks and in lakes, culminating in the ten foot Nemo, which is the yellow boat you see here just on the right. Um, development of Nemo was successful and resulted in the company receiving a contract for a capability technology demonstrator from the Defence Science Technology Group. Now, initially, Nemo came with a black box autopilot, but soon after the, uh, a new chief engineer started work, it blew up mysteriously. Luckily, the chief engineer, Lloyd, who should be on this call now and laughing at me, has had competed in the Outback Challenge, which a number of you are involved with. So he had actually experience with RG Pilot. And we moved across to RG Pilot and we were soon set, uh, back sailing along. So this is a, just an overview of the blue bottles. So they're 18 feet long sailing boats. They uh, have a large keel, which is weighted, which means when they, if they get turned over, they will self-right. They can be launched from either a boat ramp or a crane. And we're exploring possibly dropping them out of aircraft. They have uh, irradi iridium satellite modems, so we can run them over the horizon or the other side of the planet with all of the fun that comes with those. And we have recently received uh, AMSA approval to operate these via, uh, vessels anywhere within the Australian economic exclusion zone. So some of the applications we're looking at are for the Defence Force, where we're looking at anti-submarine warfare, uh, uh, mine countermeasures, so mine hunting basically. Uh, gateway comms, so this is providing communication between uh, assets above and below the water line. So generally it's difficult for things above the water to talk to anything below the water. Because we sit on that transition, we can provide a relay between the two environments. And we can also do rapid momentum assessment by uh, fully using a side scan sonar or multi-beam echo sounders. There's also opportunities with uh, border force. So sitting in um, traffic high in um, areas on the border, looking for illegal entry vehicles. So yeah, people smugglers and drug smugglers. We can do uh, surveillance of uh, critical assets. So ports, oil, uh, platforms, and the like. Uh, we're designed to stay out for a long time, and we can monitor things like uh, fishing and uh, marine reserves and the like. And with the, uh, then we can do stuff with oil and gas with seabed and pipeline mapping. And it's also a lot of uh, climate data can be, be uh, risk detected. So wind speed, wind direction, water temperatures, and so forth. So this, uh, the rigid sail, it's a, it's a the solar sail, it's a rigid sail. So it's not the fabric sail you know, a lot of people are used to seeing. It's a solid crescent shape. It can be stowed in rough weather. So if the wind gets up, we can hide it down. It, Stows flat to the deck, just below the gunnels, so any water washing over the sides won't go under it, it'll go over the top of it, keeping it safe. The solar panels front and back, so we can, no matter which way we're sailing, we can always charge our batteries from the start, except when it's down. The um, sail is actually, we've made modifications to RG Pilot in order to automatically chew, uh, turn the sail and adjust it to either the wind or the sun. So we actually have a multiple multiple different sailing modes. So we, we can go pure sailing, where all we're doing is we're letting the wind push us along. We uh, can also motor sail, where we, the sail is propelling us, and the motor's 
giving us a little bit of a kick to maintain a set speed. We have um, motor solar, where we're basically just motoring along and we're turning the cell to face the sun. In the, where we're trying to, rather than use the wind, we're trying to maximize our solar collection. And it's useful in times when there's actually no wind, so that won't give us any boost, but the sun can both propel us and provide uh, extra power to recharge batteries. And we also have another mode, which actually doesn't use the sail, but it's a flipper only mode. And I'll we'll talk about that in a little bit. So if you look at this, this is um, a video. Just take note of the battery voltage. So we start off at 26.1 volts. We do a little waypoint mission. We're facing the oceans, because that's how we roll. And at the end, two and a half hours later, we've actually got more power in our batteries at 26.3 volts than before we started. So we've, in this, we've done a number of different modes, including so, uh, motor soldering and sailing. The flipper. So the flipper is a passive device attached to the rudder. It, it has no actuation at all. And what it does is it uses the movement of the boat up and down in the waves to pull the boat forward. And the reason the rudder's here at least at the front of the boat is to maximize the motion of the boat that can be used by this flipper. And the flipper in action. So here we are actually, we've got a wind from the, you can see the wind bar here up on the top right, blowing us towards shore. And we're maintaining, if you look over here, we're using no throttle. We're just using the flipper to hold us in place as 20 knots of wind try to, tries to blow us onto that beach behind us. Uh, in the keel, we have a winch. This winch can hold up to 150 metres of 8 mil cable, uh, about 200 metres of 6 mil, or 120 metres of 10 mil cable, and can be used to... So we can tow or deploy uh, various sensors to whatever lengths required with uh, those limits. So here we are towing a sonar array, just a top-down view of the of its towing. Uh, at the rear of the boat is a communications mast. We have at the top, we have the MR, which is our weather sensor. So this tells us wind speed, wind direction. It has a compass and a GPS built in, and things like humidity sensors and air temperatures. We have fore and aft cameras. At the top of the mast, just below the MRR navigation lights. This allows us to travel at night and to be spotted. The commerce mast also carries a passive radar reflector. This is because at night, and sorry, the radar reflector is because with the sail down, we don't, act, we're not very visible to other vessels. And by using the uh, reflector, those boats with radar are better able to see us. And there's a, an assortment of antennas, including AIS, long range Wi Fi bridges, 4G, uh, 4G for uh, connection to the internet. And we're looking at adding electronic warfare, so software defined radios, radars and looking at including some mesh networking. Uh, possible payloads, so uh, sensors, again, wind, water, temperature, humidity. Uh, we can do water depth with a, just a depth sounder. Uh, so on the winch, we can have any sorts of water measurement devices. So we can do conductivity, temperature, pressure, turbidity. So, and we can lower this, these to any to various depths and get the measurements throughout the water column, which is a lot more than a lot of things can do at the moment. 
we can carry an acoustic transducer. This provides us with a gateway that comes to um, any underwater vessels or vehicles, so your, your, your AUVs or your submarines potentially. And we can listen to tagged animals such as sea turtles and sharks and whales. We can also carry uh, multi-beam e uh, echo sanders or side scan sonars and survey things like uh, wrecks and pipelines or just map the sea floor. Uh, we, we look, we've recently bought a radar, which we're looking to incorporate into our uh, collision avoidance sensor suite. That's going to be fun. And we've played around a little bit with uh, some various radios, including software phone radios to listen to radios from a long way away. So if you want to get your Chinese radio while you're sitting in the city, we can send you a send a blue bottle over for you. Or we, we've looked at mesh networking. So this is uh, like a mesh IP network. We can also detect things like uh, GPS, so we've got multiple GPS antennas and we can actually, we're actually currently looking at inc incorporating uh, technology to detect GPS spoofing. So if something terrestrial based is spoofing GPS, we can detect and localize it hopefully. Potentially we can also carry a roll for an AUV or even a small UAV which can launch from the deck. So this is a rough out layout of the boat. So the main thing is the CCU, the command and control box, which is basically the, the whole brains of the boat. So we've got an RG pilot, which is a by Navo 2 running RG pilot. It's connected to a bunch of things via network switch, including a Wi-Fi router, 4G modem, a satellite modem, uh, very, uh, an auxiliary machine uh, created to run the cameras. So we're actually running the autopilot on a separate board just to prevent any uh, conflicts and uh, overuse over use of the board. Um, so all of our motors actually listen to the PWM outputs from RG Pilot. They don't all listen to the pins on the NavIO. What they actually do is some of them plug into the Mavlink bus and listen to the Mavlink messages and get the instructions from them. And so a couple of others are actually, we've added some hooks into RG Pilot to send messages to a CAN device. So this is Bruce, the first of the blue bottles in operation. Here we're just doing a simple uh, guided waypoint. So everything on all of the motors are controlled by a PWM. So Raising the mast, turning the mast, turning the sail, rudder and throttle are all PWM servos. At this point, we're literally just sailing, motor is off, wind's about 10 knots or just under. Here we are sailing again. But this time we're using the motor just to maintain a set speed. Now we just went the speed up a little. And this is what we look like when we go flat out on the throttle. So at top speed, we can do about six knots. And if you want to see what extreme look means to us, this is an operation where we were trying to do something just outside of Jarvis Bay and the waves actually got so bad, the uh, support man boat had to be turned because people were turning the wrong color. Sadly, it meant the USV had to return because we we're under regulations that required us to be supported while we were not tied up. So because the men had to come home, so did you, the unmanned. Um, we worked actually, worked on a couple of other vehicles. So 
for AW18, which is Autonomous Warrior in 2018. It was a kind of a, a test for defense to see various autonomous platforms in operation. This happened in December of 2018. We were invite, uh, asked if we could may take the Navy's WMV and make it autonomous. And we managed, we did so by basically just taking the, the CCU from a blue bottle and putting it on top of the WMV. Uh, the main reason we were asked to do this was because the mine warfare, warfare teams have been waiting on a number of autonomous uh, AUVs and they're still waiting. Um, one of the chief things we use a lot of is what we call a barnacle. This is a Raspberry Pi with NavIO, uh, with running IG Pilot. It's, it also provides a GPS and a Mavlink uplink to uh, our in internet servers and has a Wi-Fi router. So we can basically put this down in a boat or on, on the shore, turn it on and connect our laptops to it and we're good to go. It has a 4G to give us our uh, internet access. It also provides power over ethernet for our uh, long range Wi-Fi bridges. So for your ubiquity to the boat, so we can have a local um, connection to the vehicle without relying on the 4G. Uh, the battery is 12 volts, 19.2 amp hours. And We've had barn the barn we've run the barnacles for 24 hours straight without having to on a single charge. The power charge can the power charge can also be used to power other things like antenna trackers or something like that you guys might be interested in powering. We played with a Blue Rob 2. This was basically an off-the-shelf Blue Rob 2. It's um, again you're running a Raspberry Pi. In this kind of case, it's actually running ArduSub. The uh, all the comms from the sub were going via the blue bottle, so the Mavlink and the video streams were all relayed via Bruce up to the internet over his 4G. Uh, we, we, uh, we've also done a fair bit of work now with uh, Remises. This is a commercial AUV. It's not RG Pilot based, but we've done quite a bit of work with it. And I'll show you why soon. These are the side scan sonar um, acoustic comms to the blue bottle, which acts as the gateway. We both uh, re listen to it and we control it, control it via the blue bottle gateways. And things like as it goes past, it's they, they can run auto automated target recognition to recognize things on the, on the sea floor. And these detected contacts are relayed from the acoustics to the, via the blue bottle back up to the, um, the user. And when, it, when, when it's on the surface, the blue bottle actually acts as a Wi-Fi access point, which allows it to get higher frequency position locations and to pull the data off remotely. So you don't have to you can pull it off. Um, so this is the website. So if you go to hbsocs.com.au live, you'll get a the mobile version, but there's an advanced button which will take you to something that looks much like this. And I'll show you what it looks like, what our version looks like. So this is what we see. So on the left here, we have the control panel. So we've got things like the latitude, longitude, number of satellites. So three, we get a 3D GPS fix. Water depth is currently wrong. I don't think it's a very, really 43,000 kilometers deep. And you can, you can see all, both of our boats currently at our current location here in Randwick. So we can use this uh, web-based API to control the boats. We can arm, disarm. 
we can look at uh, where's power monitoring? So I can take out the power monitoring. Here we've got two batteries. They're both reading 95%. And we can look at the power because we, we're reporting the powers of the various components. So the autopilot po box itself is running is using consuming 26 watts. The sail motors are currently in idle, still using three watts for the just the motor controller. And the power monitoring box itself is currently using two watts. Now, if I wanted to, I could go in and turn things off. I won't actually turn these off, but this is a, a, our electronics hardware on various relays. We can say turn off the sail control. Actually, I will turn the sail control off. Do I wish to? Yes. Now, if I go back to power monitor. So our control is no longer using three watts and saving us a little bit of power. And I'll turn that back on because otherwise I will forget. Sail control off. You may have heard that. We have various warnings when things get turned off and on. We can also control, turn, uh, control a lot of the processes on our computers. So we can start up things like camera captures, Collision avoidance and various and ADSBs. I don't know if we got any. Unfortunately, at this point in time, we have no boats or planes at all in view. Over here on the right. We have a drop, we've got drop downs for the cameras. I'm not working, but was work, should be working on your site. And we have our dashboard. So this dashboard tells us a lot of stuff about the current state of the boat. So we've got our current speed over ground, 0.1 knot, basically just noise and the GPS. We have the wind, which is 0 0.1 knots because it's right up against a wall and the angle, the wind direction. We have a, basically a virtual horizon showing us the roll and the pitch of the boat, which is at the moment negligible because it's on a trailer. And over here on the right, we have things that tell us. So if I, we're in basically manual mode and we're currently motor only, so the sail's not down to new not going to be used. So we have things set up so that it, when we're in uh, sail mode, the sail is automatically raised if it is safe to sail and we're on. But at the moment we're in manual. So I can change us to hold and we've now got an icon saying we've dropped into a hole, into hold. And I can change the sail mode. So uh, change from motor, now we're sail only. I'll put these back to the defaults because it's a lot safer when we do things. We also have here a series of basically dashboard lights. These are the equivalent of the lights you get on the car dashboard. So here we're being told that the mask camera is powered. It, we also get things like you'll get pop-ups if the winch deploys or the bilge pumps activate. Okay, that's time to move on, I think. So these are some of our things. We can also control the servos. So we can chain, raise the mast, turn the mast, and deploy the winch using this page. Uh, this is just a, an overview view of our comms links. So from one, it, from a boat, the way there are a lot of links back to the ground station. So we've got satellites updating every five minutes or so. We've got 4G, which feeds into a internet server, which can then be pulled down to the ground station. We have an RC remote control, the manual, manual uh, launch and recovery mostly. 
and we have the local then, so your RFD 900 pluses or your ubiquity Wi-Fi's. In this case, the control station isn't necessarily can be either on the on land or it can be on a support vessel in the vicinity. Uh, this is an overview of our Mavlink bus. So it, the bus is actually just a couple of Mav proxy clones that we've written that took, um, provide the communication between all of our software modules. So we have RG Pilot, which is the, the autopilot. We have a motor controller for the, the propeller at the bottom. This actually listens to the Mavlink bus. And listens to the uh, servo outputs and then controls the motor from that. We have uh, ADSB RX, an uh, RX ADSB receiver, which talks Mavlink already and pumps, pipes its uh, values into the bus. We have an AAS receiver, again, pumping data in, and the process and the power control modules that will uh, provide both the monitoring and the ability to control. So they push the current monitoring states into the telemetry stream and they listen to commands on the Mavlink bus. And we also have collision points and a, basically a team, set of team behaviors that also live in here. And currently it's, and then all of this gets fed via at the moment 4G and via satellite up to the server. Not currently are they encrypted, but we are looking very soon to encrypting all of our streams from the boats to the server. And apologies, we were hoping today to run a live demo, but world events conspired against us. This is a rough idea of how we would have uh, piped to the Maplink messages around. So you could have all uh, listened to the streams yourselves on your own uh, mission planners or queue ground controls as you desire. So all of the boats would feed to the operational servers, which then go out via a firewall to the public server, which you then access. So we do this for the similar reason that if a thousand clients connect to the public servers at once, they won't affect the uh, operation servers at all. We've made that mistake once before and we repeat it. Okay, this is one of our operations. So this is when we were running off at, uh, just out off Keola in the south coast between uh, Oladola and Batemans Bay. So here we were running about 10 nautical miles, about 15 or so kilometers off the, off the coast. So Bob's happily doing his thing. At this point, the East Australian current got a bit too strong, rising up to about three knots, which made uh, keeping our position a little bit unstable. So we brought it back into the shadow of uh, the island in order to provide some software updates to see if they could improve uh, handling of the currents, which they did. So all in all, we we're out there for two, eight days, two hours, traveling a total of 483 kilometers. Um, this is another test we ran. This is just a simple collision avoidance, but in this case, we're avoiding an obstacle that is detected visually. So you'll see the feed from the camera on Bob. And pretty soon he's going to, he detects. So he's now gone, oh shit, there's something in my way. And he's turned to avoid. I successfully avoided the boat in this run. Um, so part of our AWA team requirements to, to participate was we had to 
implement code that would work with Maple, which is a control system that has been developed on behalf of defence organisations in the Five Eyes group. So that's Australia, the UK, uh, US, Canada, and France. So here, we, a goal-based plan is basically you're given a task and a location. So in this example, we've got an, a, a, an area which we've been asked to survey. That's all that the operator gives to the bot. And the idea is to reduce the load on the operator. So instead of giving in a whole series of waypoints, you say, I want you to go search this location. With the idea being when the boat gets it or the plane or the uh, rover, it would then plan its route, which it would then rehearse and it would check to see if it can actually complete that in the in any time constraints and things like it won't run so long it runs out of battery. Once the operation starts, you're not necessarily tied to that rehearsed plan. You can change things if it turns out the current is stronger, weaker, or coming from a completely different direction, say for an underwater vehicle. Uh, it is possible for these plans to be assigned to more than one vehicle. So if you have <coughs> three boats to do the survey, they would have to decide between themselves how to parcel up the area. And these can be constrained using things like geofences. And at AW18, we actually use the goal-based plans to control four different vehicles. Bruce, the Blue Bottle, Grim, the WMV, and two Remuses. And this is one day at AW18. Here, Grim and Bruce go out. They're given a goal-based plan to patrol, in air, patrol areas and they execute them. Now, uh, you'll see the Kimbler has launched and it's about to deploy some Remuses. So here we're reporting the positions. So the, the positions are coming from the Remuses to the Blue Bottle being turned into MapLink data that is then pushed up to the control station back at uh, HMAS Creswell uh, on this occasion. At this point, we've now actually given uh, some goal-based plans to the Remuses and they're conducting some surveys. And we're again reporting their results. And now the day's over, you go back, get a good night's sleep. Uh, this is a simple one where the idea is this white area is, uh, is basically our communications range. And when the boat the, the, uh, the exits the area, we deliberately cut the communication links so that the boat is on its own. It's following the goal-based plan and it goes out and investigates a AIS target, gets identified as it, and returns to the patrol. So here, and then when it returns back in the comms range, we turn the communications back on, and we're able to get a picture of the interloper. In this case, it was our other USV, Bob. This is a more extravagant version where we're actually running both blue bottles, Bob and Bruce. And with them, we've got three simulated boats and they're doing a, a synchronized patrol. So they're patrolling this area and they're trying to keep evenly spaced. In this case, we've got an AAS uh, suspect vessel uh, provided by Marine Rescue out of Aladola. And in their first attempt to approach our asset, some whales interfered. So they had to back off and reposition before making another approach to our protected asset. In this case, even though Bruce is closest, Bob 
because of the relative speeds and directions is better able to approach and investigate. And he gets a photo of what's been classified, what we've classified as a fishing boat. Uh, future plans. We're currently uh, looking very much close to building the first of five new vessels. These are going to be slightly larger. Um, we're planning on doing more extended missions, so pushing it out from eight days to 28 days or more. We are looking to incorporate I IVP Helm, which is uh, been developed by MIT and it uses interval programming to decide between multiple possibly possibly conflicting behaviors on what to do next so behaviors can be things like going to the next waypoint not turning so hard because you're towing something that's delicate and or something like avoiding an obstacle other other things can be following or shadowing some target vehicle and how you decide between all of those behaviors is what I, uh, info programming is for. We're also looking at integrating a radar. We purchased it and we're about, we're looking at pulling the data from it and seeing how we can utilize it. We want to go further in our visual detections. So uh, learning our own uh, models and classifying more data. We're looking at uh, increasing possible payloads and we are looking at developing a, a manned portable version. So this is rather than the 18 foot that requires a trailer, something you can put in the back of the car and even carry down the beach and launch from the beach. It's something that can be carried easily by one, if not two people. Uh, these are some challenges we have faced and will face further. Tuning. So the Albluda models are larger and slower and less responsive than the majority of RG pilot based things. And there have been issues resulting from this. And we have other fun because of our different sailing modes, we seem to require different tuning based on which mode we're in. So if we're just motoring along, we need one set of PIDs. If we're sailing, we need a whole new set. Other things are remote diagnostics. So things like automated fault detection. If we're halfway across, across the Pacific, we need the boat to be able to do its own diagnostics and detect things like if the main, the propeller motor is drawing too much power because it's being fouled by seaweed and isn't pushing us long properly. We need those, that to be able to be detected and reported back to us. Uh, things like bandwidth and satellite communications. So when we're on satellites, we're limited to about five okay. minutes between updates. So we have to deal with those bandwidth restrictions. And we want to look at things like environmental awareness. So this is stuff like using the roll and the pitch of the vehicle to determine the height, the speed and the period of the wave. Uh, question, uh, thank you. Uh, question time. That was quite amazing. Really, really quite amazing. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, Matthew. You probably, I don't know whether you've been seeing the comments on the side because you're probably in full screen mode, but there's been a lot of people exclaiming about how incredible that, that boat is. Um, so, um, you know, I'd like to open it up to the floor for anyone who'd, who'd like to ask questions. I had a question about the uh, controls. Oh, my background, you can't see my background. Um, uh, terrible. Terrible, yeah. Um, so, is the control done? I, I know it has um, it has some electric motors. Is it a single propeller, or is it is it steering like a like a tank with the skid steering, or is it steering with a um, with a rudder? The blue bottle is a 
single propeller with a rudder. In this case, it's actually a rudder at the on the bow at the front, rather than the usual placement of the bow at the back. Right, right, yeah. So the flipper and the rudder are the same, same. Yeah. So the flipper is actually the base of the rudder. It's, yeah. So if I go back. And so the whole rudder turns. It's not like a an actuator surface on the back of it. It turns the whole thing, I assume. So this bit is the flipper. So yep. here, the flipper is the bottom bit, the flat, basically the flat surface, and the and the the the, the top the um bit that connects to the boat is the the actual rudder. So it's the vertical surface that turns the vehicle. Do you have feedback from any of the servos so you know their true position? The sail we do. The um, rudder has feedback to a uh, Pololo PWM controller, but it does not feed all the way back to the autopilot yet. And we don't currently have feedback on the actual mast raising mechanism. Right. So you detect a failure of a servo by just the behavior of the vehicle rather than detecting that it isn't truly moving? Or can you get a Pretty photo, much. like an underwater photo or something to, to see what's happening? A uh, bit of both. So we do actually have underwater cameras on these, looking at the rudder and the flipper. Mm -hmm. But those were mostly for uh, research purposes at the moment. And for detecting things like uh, fouling if uh, weed gets caught in the topper or the bottom of the rudder. So you mentioned that um, the possibility of sort of fouling weed on the propeller and detecting that. So if you detect that you, you are drawing too much current and that it appears to be a foul propeller, what can it do about it? Does it just stop using the prop or has it got some technique for trying to remove the, the weed? Well, at the moment, it doesn't detect it yet, but there are ways of removing the fouling. So a simple one is off, depending on how it's fouled, you can just throw it in reverse and that can knock it loose. Otherwise, with ours, if the prop goes completely, we have to sail home. Right, yep. So yep. We, because we have both sail, flipper and motor, we have two other modalities with which to slowly pos possibly make our way back. Yep. Hi, uh, Matt. Very impressive boat you have there. Thank you. So how, how much of the built-in RG Pilot sailing stuff are you using and, and how much um, special stuff have you got? Most of these demos were done with only in-house because we did it on an older version of RG Pilot. We're currently moving to use some of the new sailing code. So in the Great. new re rebase code we're using your tacking super yeah i mean i'm keen it, like if you want some cool stuff i mean feel free to come and uh, come and ask us all and uh, and of course f feedback on on how it's working for you like i i don't have very many people uh, messing with boats and certainly none uh, on your scale yeah hi peter can you hear me it's lloyd here Hi. Hi. If you don't know, yeah. Lloyd is my boss. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, I just like to say a big thanks to all the RG Pilot developers. Um, we've been using RG Pilot now, like Matt said, for a couple of years since um, just after I started with the company, the proprietary autopilot blew up. And uh, luckily, since I was uh, part of uh, the Outback Challenge, I suggested we use RG Pilot straight away. And um, it's been a great great autopilot for this project and um yeah like like matt said peter we've just recently rebased um up to a fairly recent version and we're starting to use your sailing code now rather than our sailing code and we're very interested to get some help from you as far as that goes great no yeah and it's fantastic uh, and to get feedback on, on how it's working yeah yeah like, like I mean, say. We're, we're out there we're out there quite a lot so we should be able to give you good feedback Fantastic. I'm looking forward to it. I think actually there could be a lot of things that you could use the scripting for uh, to do the sort of the customizations you need. Um, 
I don't know whether you've seen that, Lloyd and, and Matthew, the new scripting capability in IGPile at the Lua script. We've seen mention of it. We haven't actually tested it yet, I don't think. Yeah, I, I could imagine that some of these sort of extra capabilities and it might lower the maintenance overheads by doing them as scripts instead of doing it in the core C++ yeah, code. Because so, it would mean that rebasing should be a lot easier. So could you, could you see a way, Trudge, that we could automatically detect that the motor was running at a certain percentage, but the water speed or the speed over ground didn't match what should be yeah. that. And um, very similar to the little fail safe Lua scripts we've got in the examples. If you have a look in AP scripting examples, there's various scripts there that detect unusual conditions and then decide there's one I put in there recently that detected that the petrol motor in yep. a quad plane had died and then took special yeah, action. Right. Okay custom to that vehicle to to bring the vehicle home when it, it looked at vibration levels and it looked at rpm and decided it looks like we've lost the the petrol motor so it takes some evasive right. action cool. that's extremely similar to the sort of thing that you would yeah. want to do and that sort of business logic is great for a script so I, you may be able to stay a lot closer to the main line rg pilot yeah. uh by building that in yeah, yeah. and the scripts can run at high rate Peter Hall has done a lot of the scripting work as well um, oh, okay. So yeah. Both parts of that, so it's probably worth, you know, um, establishing a direct communication with Peter so that he can. Yeah, well, we were hoping we were hoping Peter was going to come to Australia and we were going to invite him up to Sydney to our workshop, but um, things were closed to that. <laughs> next year, next year. I, I tried to help. We funded it, but he didn't come. <laughs> <laughs> How are things with your with simulation? Do you do you use Siddle at all to, we to simulate do a lot vehicle? of simulation? Um, so if I go back to the um, so how have you built the simulation models? So uh, basically, standard Archipelago simulator. So Predator, basically, a, you, an, a, a no -sys simulator, a custom simulator, one of the built-in ones. No, no, the standard Archipelago simulator, Trish. Oh, the standard boat simulator? Yeah. yeah. Right, okay. Oh, I thought you might have added custom things for your actuators. We and have, the extra, so I've taken the sail um, versus the motor. Basically made a copy of it in Siddle and created like a Simosius, which represents the blue bottle. Right. So it, it. Very good. It does, has been modified and does simulate the. Yeah, so we, we use parameters like sim water speed and sim water dir and things like that to... Well, now it's sim tide dir and sim tide speed, but yeah. Oh, yeah, they've, they've been changed now. <laughs> yeah. So for making navigation decisions, I mean, some of the stuff that you showed off today with the avoidance would involve making a sort of do we go in front of or do we go behind type navigation decisions. Um, is that done by sort of simulating both while you while you're actually out on the water to see which is going to produce the better result, or is that done just? Uh, how do you have the algorithms decide which path to take? We've we've um we've written our in-house collision avoidance, which is um, sort of follows coal regs, if you like. So there's um for marine uh, vessels, there's uh, something called coal regs, which is collision avoidance regulations, and um, there's various uh, ways you need to avoid other vessels, but, um, and we've written some in-house stuff, but now, like Matt said, we're trying to incorporate some IVP Helm. So IVP Helm is something written by MIT that, that has a coral regs avoidance behavior, and we're trying to uh, bridge that to the RG pilot so that it can take over when it detects a collision and um, use coral regs collision avoidance behavior. Right, okay. And what data do you need about the other vessel you're trying to avoid to, to implement coal uh, regs? Do you, like somebody well, mentioned earlier, the, knowing front from back, do you need to know whether? At the moment, it's, at the moment it's mostly AIS based. So the, the demo map showed you where um, we did visual collision avoidance. That was fairly primitive. It didn't understand the pose of the other vessel at all. Mm -hmm. It just realized there was something there and it had to go around it. But with, with AIS data, we know the other vessels uh, heading, direction, speed. Yeah, and, that's like um, ADSB for the sea, isn't it? Yeah, it's like ADSB for the sea, basically. So um, yeah, we, we know more information. Therefore, we can do a proper coal rigs collision avoidance on it. 
If you go have been following Peter Hall's work on getting AIS messages implemented in the Maverick. Um, no, we, we have our own AIS module um, that injects AIS. So it, it's basically one of what we call one of our software modules and it listens to um, the NMEA 2K messages off the AIS device and injects AI, our own AIS messages into the Mavlink bus and uh, then our collision avoidance module then listens to those Mavlink messages and makes decision about avoiding collisions. So it's not actually Peter Hall's work. So that, the the, that collision avoidance module is like a separate process running on the Pi, is it? It's a separate process. So what we do is we have a process running there and it's listening to the Mavlink messages and it's determining the state of the boat. And if it sees an AOS contact that's going to be a problem, it then sets the boat into a guided mode. So it takes over control. If the boat's in order, it'll take over control. It'll set the boat into a guided mode to guide it around the um, collision. So it's a separate module to the autopilot, which we're not sure whether that's the right way to go yet or not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it makes sense within your architecture, I think, on, on a Raspberry Pi system. I think that that probably does make well, sense. Oh yeah, we, we, we've been, um, exploiting as much as we can running separate processes to do things that communicate via Mavlink. So that's, mm. that's our architecture, if you like. And you always have just the, the single pie for the autopilot. Do you, do you look at the possibility of a, a pie dying and having to go to a backup one? Have you got any? Yeah, that's a, that's a disaster for us. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, yeah the, so far the pie and the Navi are proved extremely reliable for us and uh, we've had very few failures. Yep. Yeah, I just think of the, the long lived at sea, that could be something to consider, but um, it's, it's great that it's been so reliable for you. Yeah, I mean, like Matt said, a lot of the controls on the boat, some of the controls on the boat are driven by PWM, but for the, for the um, motor control, we listen to the Mavlink bus and we listen to the servo out for the motor and we drive the motor via an RS485 connection. Mm. Um, the rudder we're planning to change, at the moment the rudder is driven PWM via a Palulu controller, but we plan to drive that via a serial controller in the future so that we get feedback from the rudder about its actual position into the autopilot itself. Um, so once, once we move away from everything being driven by, or things being driven by PWM from the, um, the NAVIO board, then we are um, able to probably cope with the failure of the Pi and the NAVIO. Yep. I don't know whether anybody else has got any suggestions there, but you know, Redundancy, building redundancy into the system seems to complicate the system horrendously to me. It does. And, uh, we've been so far very lucky that the Pi and the Navio have worked uh, extremely reliably. Yeah, some companies are going down the path of sort of using CAN bus and having multiple autopilots on the CAN bus and then yep. having a, a single module that basically listens to the CAN messages from each of the autopilots and you have a very, very yeah. simple module that then uh, you know, copes with that. That's a, that's one architecture that could be used. Um, yeah, okay. But it, it is difficult and it does greatly increase the complexity. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so it's... So far, we've um, mostly relied on all the work from the agile the developers to get to where we've got today. Mm. Well, really appreciate the presentation. This has been absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, so a huge thank you from the, from the conference to... Uh, to Matthew and Lloyd for coming along uh, this evening. And uh, Thanks, we've Chris. just got. Um, really appreciate it. And I don't know whether Matt mentioned it, but you know, we've just signed a new contract and uh, we're looking for people who may be able to help us out in the future. So if you've got good people out there, then get, get them in touch with us. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, there might be some people on the call that want to play with boats. Um, that's good. That's great. Anybody who loves to play with boats, we're happy to have them. <laughs> but it's a um, Lloyd, I, I threw my email address kind of privately, but please drop me an email because I can both hook up 
the, the, the dev team a little bit and, and perhaps put you in the right direction for some other stuff. So, fantastic. Um, Thanks, James. No worries. Thank you, Matt. All right, fantastic. Thanks cool. to both of you. And so we'll, we've got the second talk coming up in just a minute, which actually looking has forward, some... Looking forward to Randy's. Yeah, we've got uh, Randy's update on the uh, avoidance work. So um, we'll just uh, stop the video there and I will... Um,